Writing for eventual publication is quite different from just writing a story that you're going to publish on a site like Wattpad or Reddit. It's different from a story you're not going to publish at all. I learned this the hard way back when I was new to writing. It's actually a double learning curve, but it doesn't have to take you twice as long to learn it if you follow this advice on the top 10 mistakes people make when writing their books. Hi Novelteer, I'm Devlin Blake, novel writing and self-publishing expert, fiction writing coach, published author, and former ghostwriter of 200 books. The number one thing you need to know before writing your book is being able to answer the question, what genre are you writing in? When you're new to writing, it's common to just sit down, write a story, and assume the genre will reveal itself later. But that's not how modern books are written. I'm not even sure that's how older books were written. But it's often hard for writers to decide what genre their book belongs in because it can feel like it fits more than one genre. It can't. Or rather, it can't if you want it to sell. Readers are very genre loyal, even if they read multiple genres. Each genre has its own unique tropes, its own pacing, its own idea of the best way to end a book, its own style of suspense, of violence, of how it handles sex, death, and so on. If you get these tropes wrong by mashing up ones from different genres, it's a surefire way to displease your readers and not sell many books. These tropes are not something to get around. They are the point of the story. It's a feature, not a bug, as they say in tech. And if you don't give readers what they want from your chosen genre, they won't give you any future attention. They'll go to authors who do. Later, once you've built a name for yourself and have some loyal readers, you can experiment more with manipulating tropes. Right now, though, it's like sitting down at the piano and trying to play Chopin when you can't even read music or know the scales. Knowing your genre tells you everything from the book length to the chapter length to the tropes, and in some cases, even the ending. Like romance has a built-in happy ending, that's just how it goes. Knowing this before you start writing makes actually writing your book so much easier. Not knowing it is a guaranteed way to flounder and make your book writing so much harder than it has to be. Now let's talk about the second mistake. Writing in a genre you don't read. I once had a student tell me she wanted to write a romance because she loved the true love conquers all concept, which is what romances are about. But she didn't read romance because she hated the tropes. Now the tropes she was talking about specifically were the misogynistic ones of abduction and force, along with the more gentle ones of women giving up her big city career and dumping her city fiancé to go live in a small town with her new boyfriend, or the big man's romantic gesture to win the woman away from the fiancé she already had. And I can see why she hated those tropes. Those are horrible, toxic tropes, even if Hallmark Movie does love them. But if she had actually read a romance published in the last ten years, specifically from indie published authors instead of traditional ones, she would have seen that those tropes are actually out of favor for readers. Readers don't want to see that anymore. Hallmark movies are another story. But readers today who read romance want to see empowered women, gentle but protective men, healthy relationships, non-toxic families and cultures, and magi sacrifices, which is where both partners secretly give up the most important thing in the world to them so that the other can be happy. That's based on the gift of the magi. Times change. Readers' expectations change. By reading newer works in your chosen genre, you can see what readers want right now. So read the newer stuff in your chosen genre. This is what readers want to see. Because successful writing is nothing more than knowing what readers want and giving it to them. So now let's talk about the third mistake that new writers make. Caring about what non-readers think. I get it. Friends and family, other writing groups, they can make you feel uncomfortable about your writing. Maybe you're writing a story where someone carves up a human for dinner. Or maybe you're writing a book so hot it should be X-rated. And if you are, you're likely worried about what your friends and family are going to think. Well, they won't. They won't be thinking, that is. No one really cares about your book except the people who love to read this kind of thing. And if they love to read it, just give them what they want. Anyone else who isn't buying or reading books like yours, their opinion doesn't matter. Another thing to be wary of is people who give advice who don't get your book or your genre. This is true of other writers, editors, friends, online critics, anyone. If someone doesn't like or read romance, don't take their advice on your romance. Don't ask your overly religious aunt what she thinks of your fantasy magic system where gods are just running around. And don't listen to that guy online who says good books don't do X, especially if X is expected in this genre. They're not your readers. Their opinions don't matter. The only opinions that matter are those of your readers. 
and you can discover those opinions by checking out the best-selling indie published books in your genre. Read the books, read the reviews, see what the readers loved about them, what they hated about them, and what your book can do just as well, if not better. Because at the end of the day, the only opinion that matters is that of your readers. And if you're still uncomfortable with the idea of your family and friends knowing you write such things, just use a pen name. The next mistake is not nailing down your characters right from the start. It's common to want to skip over the characters and get right to the writing, but that's not what's best for your book and that's not what's going to make the readers happy or, or the book easy to write. The heart of your book is the characters. If you get those right, your readers will forgive anything else. If you don't do enough work on getting to know your characters right at the start, then you won't know how the book should go. After all, a good story is how characters react to things. Think of any great story. Harry Potter, Buffy, Golden Girls, any fan will tell you it's the characters, not the situations, that made those stories so memorable. Everyone has a favorite character and a least favorite character from their favorite story. This is also the premise that soap operas worked on. Anyone remember those? And while, yes, those stories were melodramatic and over the top, people related to those characters and kept coming back to them. They ran for a really long time. This is also why cozies are popular. It's not actually about solving the mystery when you're writing a cozy mystery. It's about the fun characters you meet along the way. I once saw a review for an indie movie on Amazon, and it always stuck with me. He talked about how flat the characters were, and it ended with, sure, it had a happy ending, but the characters were so bad, who really cared? Characters are what get your readers interested in your book. The next mistake that new writers make is expecting it to be perfect. Remember the last time you went dress shopping in a store? The first dress was the wrong size. Then it's the wrong colors, or the fit isn't flattering, and a million other reasons that lead you to try on a bunch of other dresses other than that first dress until you find the perfect one. We all know this about dress shopping, and don't consider it a failure if we don't find the perfect dress as the very first one we pick up. But rough drafts are similar to that. The first one is not a perfect fit. The first one is never going to be a perfect fit. You have to try on lots of fits and styles when it comes to figuring out what goes where, what needs to be added, what needs to be cut, and what needs to be shifted entirely. It's not a moral failing. It doesn't mean you're a bad writer or that your book won't be good when it's actually done. It's all part of the process, and expecting that can make it writing easier and more fun. One of the worst things you can do is try to make your rough draft perfect. Some people take as long as 10 years to write a rough draft, which only guarantees one thing. That is going to be awful. The longer it takes you to write a rough draft, the worse your rough draft is going to be. The reason for this is simple. Once all your ideas are laid out on the page, you can figure out what to keep and what to shift and what to reorganize. You can't do that before they're all out there, and you can't edit a blank page. So get that rough draft written as fast as possible, then change it all around. That's how you get a good book. Now, I want to preface this next tip by saying I love Stephen King. I love his writing, and a lot of his writing advice is spot on. On writing is a great book. However, I also feel like he's done a lot of harm to the writing community by demonizing outlines. Some people like King can sit down and write a story without an outline. And some people like Beethoven can keep playing piano even if they lose their hearing. The average person like you and me can't do that. And I actually tried. Not about the piano thing, but about writing a story without an outline. I got an idea for a book, and once I started writing, I got 150,000 words in and realized I had no story. Ouch. That was a lot of time and effort wasted. I had a lot of great scenes, solid characters, good world building, but they just didn't connect well enough together to make a whole story. Because a story is more than just a bunch of random scenes to hit a word count. A story is each scene building on each other, like a Jenga game. If you cut a scene, the whole story should come toppling down. But my 150,000 words didn't do that. Nothing was built on top of each other, and far too many scenes had no built up at all. That's when I realized I didn't have a story. I had a mess. So I sat down and actually did the work of outlining. And here's what I learned. It's a guideline, not a straitjacket. And because I have that guideline, I was able to stray away from the path at times and not get too lost. And when my explorations ended up somewhere really good, that made it into the outline. Because you can always revise an outline, and you can always find your way back with an outline. There's no getting lost with one. There's no writer's block once you know how to do it properly. It makes writing more fun and more creative, just like dancing to music is more fun than dancing without music. The outline is your music. It's your guideline. It makes writing your book possible even with a busy life and career. 
So take the time to outline in the very beginning and it'll pay off down the line. Another mistake that writers make right off the bat is they don't know if they're going to publish traditional or indie. Knowing how you're going to publish your book is one of those things that aspiring writers say they'll worry about later because either way is good, right? Well, that's not right. And here's why. Now before I say this, I'm going to say that I am a huge proponent of self-publishing. It's what I teach, it's what I do, but I also have writer friends in traditional publishing world, and there's a reason that deciding in advance matters. There are a lot of dead genres in traditional writing. There are a lot of emerging genres and tropes that sell well in self-publishing, but won't even be considered in traditional publishing. New adult is an emerging genre. It combines the best aspects of both young adult and adult books. So basically like The Hunger Games or Harry Potter, but with college age or early to mid-20 characters instead. The stories are still about finding yourself and coming of age, but they have sex, drinking, and other things that young adult books can't actually get away with. This genre is growing in popularity, in self-publishing, but is non-existent in the traditional publishing world. You're not actually going to find it. In fact, I can't think of any traditional publisher who's going to take you seriously if you market your book as new adult. Women's midlife paranormal fiction is another new type of genre you're not going to see traditionally published. It's when a woman in her midlife has to start over, but she has to do it as part of the supernatural community. This is a fun genre. It's also another new genre that's rising in popularity. Because while the concept of a woman starting over has always been a literary genre, combining it with paranormal means she can have a happier ending than she can in the real world. And it's more fun for the reader as well. And don't even get me started on dinosaur erotica. Yes, that is a thing, and no, you're not going to find that traditionally published, and that's for certain. It does sell. And obviously, traditionally publishing houses do not want that. But new genres aren't the only genres traditional publishing houses refuse to publish. There are also many traditional genres that are considered dead right now, and it's going to need an extra special book to resurrect them. Now yours might be it, but why go through the hassle of querying for years when you can get your book selling right now and are able to write more books for the future? Some dead genres include western, young adult, zombie, dystopia, paranormal romance, magic schools, and a bunch of others. So if you're hoping to be traditionally published, don't write in any of these genres. Another thing that traditionally published books don't like has to do with own voices. Remember that one? It started out with well-intentioned, but now it's kind of just a mess. While it's good advice that a non-marginalized group shouldn't really be writing about the experience of a marginalized group unless you're willing to do a ton of research, traditional publishing has taken it one step further to say that if you are a marginalized character, you have to present a certain way, even if you are in the marginalized group yourself so readers can understand. Of course, this is just some kind of ism with another name and will not result in the story you want to tell because no real-life person from any marginalized group acts the exact same way as any other person from the same group. That's just not how people work. All these things I mentioned are things that will matter to a traditional publishing house. So if you don't know before you start writing which route you want to go and you have no idea what kind of story you want to write in order to be a success, if you decide to self-publish, you have many more story options open for you than if you decide you want to publish traditionally. So it's best to know that before you start writing anything. Now once your book is written, it's time to hire editors. And this is where a lot of writers mess up because they want to skip the editor. But you shouldn't. You're going to need a developmental editor for certain. This is an editor who goes through and points out all the issues with your book. This is for stuff like plot holes, or things that are badly described, inaccurate research, parts of the book that make no sense, Parts of the book that add nothing to the story, showing where your characters are either flat or acting out of character, and so on. They point out things that readers will have an issue with. For example, in my book, The Assassin's Secret, formerly titled The Last Gala, it's set in 1890, and someone was using the vents of the heating system to help drive a lady mad. My editor pointed out that there were no heating systems of that kind back then. However, I did the research, and I knew there were. They were uncommon, though, and expensive, and they didn't work that well, but they did exist back then, and they would have had vents. This is known as the Tiffany problem, where something seems too modern to be in historical fiction, even when it's correct. And I realized if it was a problem for my editor, it would be a problem for my readers. Now, it does actually fit in character, because this particular character's husband was all about showing off how much money he had, and an expensive, impractical heating system would do it. 
I fixed the Tiffany problem by having one character talking about it to another character about how new it was and how it was such a waste of money and how it didn't even work right and how the house was converted for vents. Now, there was no more Tiffany problem in my book. But that's something I wouldn't have caught because the research was accurate and I forgot that the other readers wouldn't see it as accurate. Another type of editor you might need is a sensitivity editor or a specialty editor. This is an editor from a marginalized group that also appears in your book to tell you what the community at large considers offensive. For example, it's generally accepted that it's not offensive to refer to an Italian as having olive skin, but it is offensive to refer to a black person as having coffee-colored skin or to describe black hair as wiry. Another issue that pops up is writing about someone with any kind of disability or neurodivergence without consulting any other member of that group. Even with the best of intentions, it's an easy thing to get wrong, and you don't know what you don't know. A sensitivity editor will ensure that you're not coming across as a bigot. A third type of editor you might need, depending on your genre, is a cultural or technical editor. This is for stories that take place outside the realm of an author's expertise. For example, many American writers write romances set in Regency England, and when the writer doesn't do enough research to understand how that unique time period worked in England regarding the upper class, middle class, and nobility, it shows. Another example is when you're writing a more modern story with a heavy emphasis on something like the military lifestyle, the cop lifestyle, the country lifestyle, the city lifestyle, and any other lifestyle you don't know anything about. Again, your readers do know something about this and will always be able to tell and it's going to sour them on your future books. So before you hire an editor, determine what kind of editors you need and make sure to vet them properly. The ninth tip is not accepting your book is going to change. I understand your book is your baby, and like a baby, it's going to change as it and you grow. It's going to have a million incarnations before you get it right, and that's fine. There might come a point where it barely resembles your original idea, and that's still fine. One of the books I tried writing started out with so many flashbacks, I realized I should just be writing a different book entirely, one that focused on just that period of time, and it turned out to be a much better book. I had a client who actually thought about starting their story in a bookstore, but at the end they started it in an artist studio because that was so much better for their unique story. And don't even get me started on the time I was writing a dark fantasy and realized at the halfway point it wasn't dark, not at all. It needed to be written as lighthearted in order to work. Characters get added. Characters get removed and combined. Locations change. Symbols get scrapped. Your favorite scene that inspired the book in the first place gets scrapped. All this is perfectly fine. It's part of the process of writing your book and you discovering yourself as a writer. You're not being disloyal to your book by making changes. You're not compromising your art. You're giving it the best shot at life. And in the same way children don't always act the way you expect them to, books don't either, and that's perfectly fine. And the final tip that I'm going to give new writers is that new writers don't always learn from credible sources. Now there's a lot of advice on there on how to write a book. A lot. Everything from books to writing books, to magazines, to online articles, to entire colleges that are dedicated to creative writing. But the fact is, and I say this as a person who took all that and still had to learn the hard way myself by reading thousands of books and ghostwriting 200 books, most of that advice isn't very good. Sometimes the loudest, most persistent advice comes from people who actually haven't written any books or have written books so many years ago they aren't aware that the writing landscape has changed. I find that's the problem with most creative writing schools. In order to write a good book, you have to listen to credible people. People who not only make a living teaching you how to write a book, but who have also written books and published books themselves in the last 20 years. Because if that advice is from before 2007, which is when Kindle Direct Publishing came out and forever changed the landscape, it's not really good advice anymore. Readers and the publishing landscape have moved on. Tropes have changed, genres have changed, everything has changed. My new program is a credible source for modern writers. It features what I've learned from reading thousands of books and writing hundreds of them. You can actually check it out at the link below. So if you want some writing advice that can help you make sense of this brave new world of writing, do check it out.